Today's gonna be the first of several lectures we do on enzymes. And yes, you'll get to snap crayons. Um, so basically we can think about a crayon and think about it snapping. It's not just gonna snap on its own, right? You have to put some work in to actually get it to snap. So it might be that the crayon is a lot happier when it's in the snap form, and you might be a little happier if you had something against Crayola. But bottom line, it doesn't just happen on its own. No matter how favorable a reaction might be, it's not just gonna happen. That bag of sugar is not just gonna combust because it's around oxygen. Instead, there's gonna be like a high activation barrier to reactions happening. And so when we talk about like thermodynamic favorability, that's really only a part of the picture. In order to get reactions to happen and to at like a reasonable rate, and to get specific reactions to happen, we need enzymes, we need reaction helpers, speed uppers, reaction mediators, we need proteins typically that are going to pull things together in the right place, in the right orientation, help things get into that really, really awkward state right before it snaps, stabilize that what we call transition state, Enzymes are going to do all this great stuff. They're going to make it easier for the reactions to happen, allow reactions to happen in the first place. We're going to talk all about them. We're going to start with by talking about some of the fundamentals about them, types of enzymes, what type of reactions they catalyze. Then we'll talk about kinetics. Then we'll talk about, we'll just like look at specific, oh, we'll talk about like inhibi inhibitors. Then we'll look at specific examples of enzymes. Lots of examples when we're going through metabolism and we're talking about the making and breaking of molecules which typically uses enzymes. So we'll have lots of lessons of enzymes, but hopefully you'll see that there's a lot of details that I don't need you to worry about. And really I want you to focus on the fundamentals, being able to follow reaction mechanisms, being able to interpret reaction coordinate diagrams, and being able to kind of see the trends that are in play. Cause kind of like organic chemistry, you had all those different mechanisms, but it was really like the same thing over and over again. If you think about nucleophile attacks electrophile, same deal here. We're just making it easier for that to happen. There's going to be a lot in this lecture. And if you're looking to enzymes in general, there's a lot of information and things can get really kind of overwhelming. So let's focus on what my goals for you are. I want you to be able to explain what enzymes are and what they aren't. Describe common strategies that enzymes use to catalyze reactions. Interpret reaction coordinate diagrams. Identify nucleophiles and electrophiles interpret reaction mechanisms, all that like arrow pushing, um, and classify enzymes based on reaction type or based or classify what's happening in a reaction, um, like what type of enzyme would be involved. So let's start by talking a little bit more about what enzymes actually are. So enzymes are typically proteins. They can sometimes be protein and RNA, sometimes RNA itself, we call those like ribozymes, but we're just gonna be focusing for the most part on simple protein enzymes. And what these are going to do is they're going to make it easier to reach equilibrium. They're going to speed up reaction rates, but they're not going to change whether or not a reaction is thermodynamically favorable. And so, you know, I've been going on and on and on about like kind of like thermodynamic favorability, but trying to make you see like it's not actually, it doesn't mean likely. Whether or not something happens is also going to depend and how fast it happens is going to depend on how hard it actually is to get to that thermodynamically favorable state. So I like to think of things as kind of there being a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. If you're on one side of the rainbow, you might really, really want to go get to that pot of gold, but you have to climb over a big rainbow in order to get there. And this is like a reaction with a um, this is like any sort of reaction, even a reaction with a really big negative delta G. So even a reaction where the products are going to be much more favorable than the reactants, it's not like they're just going to spoof, like poof, go and form the products right away. Instead, there's going to be some sort of barrier in the way, some sort of activation barrier. And this barrier can be really, really tall. And so your sugar and your, that sugar bag of sugar you have isn't just going to like explode and because it would be favorable to be in like all the broken up state. Um, that's like, I mean, we break down sugar in our bodies to get, um, to get energy, but if we have sugar and oxygen, it's not just going to like poof, like go and um, produce all this energy. Instead, there's going to be a bunch of activation energy that's actually going to be required in order for things to happen. And what's going to happen is that enzymes are going to make it so that 
yes, there will still be an activation barrier, but it won't be as dramatic. And the enzyme, so the enzyme is basically going to lower the activation barrier, and we'll talk about ways in which this can happen. But what's really, really important is that the enzyme isn't going to change that overall favorability. And it's not, so it's not going to be able to make something thermodynamically favorable that wasn't, or one, won't it be able to make something unfavorable that was already favorable? But remember that when we're talking about the, the delta G, when we're talking about this change in free energy, this is going to be talking about like at equilibrium. If you were to just like put those reactants together and go, go for a walk and you come back, are they going to have reacted or not? Well, the activation barrier is going to depend on that. But say you go for a really, really, really long walk, like years and years and years and years and years and come back. Well, now what are you going to find? Are you going to find it mostly products or mostly reactants? And so that's what Delta G is telling you about. It's telling you about if you were to let things reach equilibrium, where would you find, what would you find more of? But in order to get over that, remember, you have to get past that activation barrier. And the top of this activation barrier is a point we call the transition state. And we often... Um, show it as this kind of like double dagger. And so this double dagger is representing the transition state, which is kind of the tipping point. So it's not an actual like reaction intermediate. It's not like a finite thing that you can detect. It's that fleeting instantaneous moment when you're like on the tippy tippy top of that rainbow. So you need some energy in order to get to that top of the rainbow. But then what's going to happen is once you're at the top and you're at that tipping point, you're at the transition state, well, now you can go either way. If you go to the more favorable side, um, well, then you're going to be in a state that it requires even more energy in order to get to that top of the activation barrier. So you're more likely to stay in that favorable state. And if you were to tip the other way, well, then you would be able to go back up to the top of the rainbow more quickly. So the, the change in the, the difference in the energy between the products and between the reactants is going to determine your delta G. It's going to determine, okay, well, if you let them reach equilibrium, what would the proportions be? But in biochemistry, we're basically almost never going to actually let anything reach equilibrium. We're going to drive the reaction in the direction we want, such as by um, controlling the concentrations and that sort of thing. And so we'll talk more about that when we get into metabolism. But today let's talk more about just how enzymes do what they do. How are they reducing that barrier, that activation barrier? So in order to understand this, we need to go back to our Gibbs free energy um, stuff. So we've been looking at Delta G, but what goes into that Delta G? So that Delta G is made up of our enthalpy and our entropy. And so I find entropy much easier to think about. So basically, do your products have more more freedom than your reactants? If they do, that's great. Things like being free, things like having movement, things like being disordered. And so if you have an increase in entropy, that's going to be favorable. Because remember, we want that negative delta G, which is saying our products are more energetically favorable than our reactants. Um, you're happier at the bottom of the roller coaster, or at least you're less um, less energetic or a little calmer at the bottom of the roller coaster than at the top. Similarly, molecules are going to have lower energy in their more favorable state. And so if we, ha we have entropy being subtracted, and so if we have a positive entropy, we're going to then decrease the free energy, that we're going to have a negative free energy, or we'll have a lower free energy, and this will be better. Whether or not that free energy is actually negative, though, that'll also depend on the enthalpy. So the enthalpy is telling us about like bonding and interactions. And so basically, you want to see, OK, are, are there new bonds and interactions more favorable than the old ones? And for this, you need to consider both the interactions with the like all the interactions with the solute as well. So all that stuff we talked about with water, all that's going to apply here. So remember that delta G is a state function. It depends only on the initial and final states. So it depends only on like your reactants and your products and the difference in energy between them. But the path to get between them can be very, very different. And the enzyme can alter this path. 
We're going to talk a lot about different ways that the enzyme can do this, such as by, at, by having like binding interactions that are going to offset the cost um, to the, get to that activation energy, as well as they'll also provide our specificity. And so we'll take a look at this sort of thing in a minute. But first, we've been talking about like reacting some products. But when we're discussing enzymes, we're now going to switch to talking about substrates and products. So we call our reactant substrates in the case of enzymes. Um, so remember, we could use that word ligand to talk about a binding partner. And we said that was kind of like a generic term. Well, substrates are going to be the binding partners of enzymes that the enzymes are going to act upon and change in some way. So remember, S substrates are the S starting materials for enzymes. So it's not just a ligand. Um, so enzymes can bind other things too. And we can talk about like enzyme cofactors. Um, and we will talk about enzyme cofactors. These could be things like metals or they can be things like vitamins. Um, and these can be important because they're going to provide additional functional group opportunities that a protein alone wouldn't have with them. So we can talk about an APO enzyme, which is an enzyme by itself. And then it has like a cofactor. And when they're bound together, you get a holoenzyme. Um, and so there are different types of cofactors, including those metals, including organic compounds, things like vitamins. And we'll see lots of examples of those come into play. But in terms of the substrate, that's the thing that the enzyme is actually going to modify. So this would be the crayon that we are going to snap. Um, and then the place where that binds is going to be the active site. So the active site is the part of an enzyme where the where the action happens, where the ligand binds and gets where the substrate binds and gets changed. Now, if you look at an enzyme, it might be really, really big and there might be a really, really small active site um, where that substrate is actually binding. And there might only be a couple of amino acid residues that are going to be really important. We often call these like catalytic residues. You might have some catalytic residues that are actually directly helping in, um, make the reaction happen. And then you might also have some residues that are important for binding the substrate directly. But so why do you need that whole enzyme overall? Why do you need that big old protein? There are a few reasons. One is that it's going to it might have like binding sites for other things that's going to allow for regulation. But one of the most important things is that basically you're going to have a lot of, you're going to actually make a lot of interactions with the substrate, even if there's only a couple that are making really key ones. Um, basically, the whole enzyme has to, has to adapt for that. And so you often get these like changes in the shape of the enzyme, you get this kind of like induced fit we'll talk about where the enzyme is kind of molding itself around, around the substrate. And all of that is going to require, it can require changes that are far away in the enzyme, just like we saw with hemoglobin, how one the something happening in one part can like lead to a ripple effect, like an allosteric effect. We can get things like that in enzymes too. And we're going to have, um, like I said, there's there's often like some very critical interactions, but then there's also like networks of interactions that are going to be binding to this substrate. And all of these individual weak interactions are going to provide the energy for the catalysis, um, as well as provide specificity. So we're going to have lots and lots of these weak interactions. And sometimes, as we'll see, we'll also have covalent interactions. But if you didn't have that big old enzyme, you wouldn't be able to get all those interactions. You wouldn't be able to get all that specificity um, and that sort of thing. So that's why enzymes are a lot bigger than you would think that they need to be. And remember, remember, remember that enzymes are going to catalyze the reaction in both directions. So no matter how high the transition state, the ball can still drop either way just as easily. I mean, you can slide down either way of the rainbow just as easily. But if you go when you reach that pot of gold, then you're less likely um it's harder for you to slide all to climb all the way up the rainbow. There's a higher um, cost to get back up. Your activation energy would be even bigger to go from the products to the um, tipping point than it would from the reactants or from the substrate to the tipping point. Um, and note that you'll actually, we kind of like simplify things when we go from like E plus S. So basically our enzyme and our substrate not interacting to ES. Um, so in when they're interacting, to the E plus P um, when they're like, the products are released. Um, but it, this is actually a little more complicated because what you have is you have the binding, then you, so you form your complex with the substrate, and then you have to actually change that complex into product. But right now they're still gonna be stuck to one another. 
Um, so you'd actually have EP and then the EP has to get released. Um, so even here, I've simplified it, but you're actually gonna get these intermediates where the enzyme is gonna be bound to the substrate or when the enzyme is going to be bound to the products and then those have to be released. But overall, we get this equilibrium um, happening that we can kind of just, just represent with this simplified notation. But as we see with, the, with our reaction coordinate diagrams, you will see those different states. So let's get into talking about those interaction, um, those reaction coordinate diagrams. So this is going to, on the y-axis, we'll have our free energy, so our G. And on the x-axis, this is just like an arbitrary like reaction coordinate. So it's saying as the reaction is going along, this is the change in the energy. It's not telling you about any specific time or anything like this. This tells you nothing about the rate. Um, it's just telling you about like place in the reaction. So you can make this super duper duper wide. You can make this super duper skinny. Um, basically, you just make it enough so that you can you have enough room to plot all of the different points you need to plot. Now, we're delta G, that's the difference between our substrate and our product. And remember that a negative delta G is thermodynamically favorable. That's saying if we let them reach equilibrium, you'd find more products. If we let you, if we let the leprechauns um hang out on the on the by the rainbow, they're more you're more likely to find them by the pot of gold if you let them reach equilibrium. And alternatively, a positive delta G is thermodynamically unfavorable. This is saying that, well, if you have a positive delta G, that would mean that your products had a higher energy than your substrates, and this would be unfavorable because you can think about it, okay, well, now it's easier to get to the other side of the rainbow back where there wasn't gold before. So, and then the more negative delta G is, the more favorable things are in the downward direction. So the farther down this P state is going to be, um, the more favorable it is. And the more favorable it is, the harder it is to go in reverse. So you can see in this chart um, from book, basically the change, um, the activation energy. So the third transition state remembers like this double dagger. And so the delta G double dagger from your substrate to your product. So basically this part, this activation barrier is going to be smaller than the activation barrier to go from P to the tipping point to that transition state. Okay, and then basically the delta G naught, um, that's telling you like between your S and between your P. Because remember that you're not changing the alt, you're not changing this delta G. This is the delta G. Um, and then this is just like the delta G double dagger. So basically you're you're adding an X, you have an other, you have an additional step in between these, but delta G is the state function between just the S and just the P. Um, because remember when you have this going up, you also have this coming down. So these cancel each other out. Um, when you're going like up, you have to get to the top of the hill, but then you get that energy back when you go to the bottom of the hill. So this is gonna cancel each other out and not contribute to your overall delta G but it will contribute to the speed at which the reaction happens. But delta G itself is that state function. And to remember that delta G isn't always going to be negative um, and enzymes can't change that. So we're gonna be looking at mostly at examples in which the, which the products are more favorable and which our delta G is negative, but and so this isn't always the case, even, even for enzyme catalyzed reactions. And so we'll see, um, basically, when we talk about um, all sorts of biochemical metabolism stuff that will have coupled reactions and things like this, um, we'll be taking away the products as they form to kind of try to drive the reaction if it's not very favorable. The enzyme can't change that, but it can offer alternative routes to get to the products. And these routes can have lower activation barriers that make it more likely to happen. So things can get more complicated looking when you're talking about enzymes you have, and you have these like multi, um, multi-peaked reactant coordinate diagrams where the troughs are basically intermediates and then the peaks are going to be transition states. And yes, I said states, there are multiple transition states um, often. But typically there's gonna be one that's going to be bigger than the others. And this is going to be your rate limiting step. Um, and so basically, no matter how complicated your diagram looks, no matter how many peaks, the rate limiting step, the transition state we care most about is going to be that one that has the highest, um, the highest delta G double dagger.
So the one in which there's that biggest barrier to reach, this is going to be your rate limiting step because no matter how fast the stuff is going on this side of it, and no matter how fast the stuff is going on this side of it, it's all like everything, there's this hold up here. And so these, you can have this big pile up of stuff before here, but that wouldn't really pile up because of equilibrium and all that. Um, so bottom line, this is going to be your rate limiting step. Once you get over that, then things will go more easily. And sometimes it might be the first step, sometimes it might be one of the last steps, but this is what it would be. And that would be your rate limiting step. So how are enzymes actually going to be lowering the activation barrier? They provide binding energy that offsets what would have been the uncatalyzed activation barrier by forming favorable interactions um, and or covalent bonds with the substrate. When we talk about like bonding energy, when we talk about interactions, so interactions that are um, that are either covalent or non-covalent, all of our good old IMFs, what we're talking about is change in enthalpy. And we have to say, okay, are, are the new bonds and interactions more favorable than the old ones? So remember, these can be a lot of weak interactions. They can be things like even our transient interactions, or they can be stronger interactions. So remember, when we're talking about our intermolecular forces, in order of decreasing strength, we have our ionic bonds, our salt bridges hydrogen bonds, other permanent dipole-dipole, other transient dipole-based attractions. All of these are contributing and all of these are relatively weak. Remember too that for, for a salt bond bridge, for an ionic bond, you have to have two full charges. So you can have an ion-induced dipole and you can have an ion dipole, but those are not salt bridges. For a salt bridge, for an ionic bond, you have to have a cation and you have to have a um, an anion. You need to have full charges. So all of these are going to, though, contribute to enthalpy. And remember, if we think back to our enzyme substrate, um, the like the protein structure, we have that big old structure, that big old enzyme, kind of like hugging the hugging the um, hugging the substrate. All of those interactions, those nice warm cuzzy cuddly interactions, making the substrate more comfortable. Those are going to be more, um, if they're more favorable than the interactions that you had to break, well, now you're going to get to that binding energy. And that binding energy is then going to be able to be used to offset the cost. Um, and so um, basically here, this like Delta GM, it's talking about like magnet because it's this weird thing from your book, um, but you often see this like written as like Delta GB, this will be your binding energy. And it's basically the difference between the uncatalyzed and the catalyzed versions. But now let's think about where we actually want the enzyme to be hugging our substrate, like in what form? Okay, now go ahead and take your crayon and hold it really, really tight. Is it breaking? How about now? How about now? No, if we bind it really, if we're holding it on really, really tight when we're bound to the substrate, that's not going to be helpful. In fact, it's going to make it harder to change it. We're going to be stabilizing the, like the substrate form. But now go ahead and start trying to bend your crayon. Do it slowly so you don't snap it too fast and try to get to that really awkward point at which it feels like it's about to break. That, that is your transition state, or at least it mimics your transition state, because remember the transition state is really, really fleeting, um, and you can't even isolate it. So, okay, now go further, go further, snap. That point at which it snapped, that is your transition state. Okay, and that is the point that you want to actually be stabilizing. That's going to be the part at which you have the highest activation barrier. That's going to be the part at which you is hardest to reach. And so you want to lower the cost to reaching that. And the best way to lower the cost to reaching that is to make it so that your most favorable interactions are at that point, are at that point when, this, when the crayon is about to snap. Now, if you're now hold on to the products really tight, those crayon pieces. Okay, pulled it on. Keep pulled it on. Okay, now go and break another crayon. No, I didn't say release your crayons. See, if you're held onto the products, that's gonna make it work. You can't reuse yourself. So that wouldn't be helpful either. And so we want to stabilize that transition state. This is what the enzyme wants to do. This is what the enzyme is going to do. But, so imagine that transition state. You had to put a little work in to get there, right? You had to be providing all that like binding energy and stuff. You had to be kind of like stressing, stretching yourself, your hands. You couldn't just start with your hands in the state at which things broke or else the crayon wouldn't fit. 
And so in, in order to have that crayon fit in that transition state, we basically have to have this thing called induced fit, where the enzyme is kind of going to change shape a bit. Um, so remember when we have a protein change shape, we call it a conformational change. So the enzyme is going to kind of undergo a small conformational change, or it could be a bigger one, but it's kind of going to cradle that substrate and kind of like move it to the bent, the, to that awkward state. But at that awkward state, that is when you have the most of those favorable interactions. And so you might have heard of like a lock and key mechanism where, oh, the substrate, like, is it like a key that fits in the lock, which helps explain why enzymes are really specific. But really, it's more of this like induced fit mechanism. And instead of your the the key like being in its normal key form, it's in like this bent form or um your whatever. You, hopefully, you know what I'm talking about. Basically, we want to stabilize that transition state. So in your book, they're showing an example of this where basically they're imagining this um stick A's where there's magnets that are acting to provide the binding energy. And they're showing like, yeah, if you if you stabilize your substrate, well, now what's going to happen is that you're going to lower, um, you're going to raise your overall activation er energy because you're lowering where you're starting from. And so remember that the points on here, these are basically representing this intermediate. So this is saying this is the complex of the enzyme and the substrate. So here you have enzyme plus substrate. Here you have enzyme substrate. Here you have um, your enzyme product. They're not showing the release of the products. Um, so sometimes you'll see like a second state. Um, it, people draw things different ways. But basic bottom line is you have a bigger activation air barrier if you were to stabilize the substrate bound for the substrate form. Um, but if you stabilize the transition state, well, now you're basically able to lower that cost. Okay, so let's get a little more into what a reaction intermediate is versus a reaction transition state. So intermediates are actual isolatable, or at least theoretically isolatable, if you have the um, equipment. Um, and some, some of these are longer lived than others, um, but they're stable enough to detect. But transition states, on the other hand, are fleeting and not isolatable. So they're super duper unstable. They have a lifetime that's shorter than a bond vibration. Um, and But we know they exist. I mean, they must exist in order to get from that unsnapped form to that snapped form. You have to go through that point at which things snap. You have to go through the top of the rainbow. The top of the rainbow is just a lot sharper than it actually looks in the diagrams. Um, and so it's kind of like Santa, we know he exists because he um, we see this presence in the morning, but we can't, we're unable to capture him in action. Okay. So these involve like partial bonds forming and breaking and partial charges. And so they're often really, really awkward. And the enzyme is going to be able to kind of do things like provide the um, opposite charges and things like this to help stabilize them. And again, this is the transition states are typically indicated by these um, double dagger symbol and the transition state will often be um, shown in, in brackets. So to show you an example and to try to help directly see what's the transition state and what's an intermediate, we need to review our arrow pushing. So remember the rules for arrow pushing from organic chemistry? Your arrows are going to start at a lone pair of electrons or a pi bond, so like a double bond or a triple bond. Um, and they're going to always go from nucleophile to electrophile. So remember that our nucleophile um, they are the things with typically a lone pair of electrons that is going to seek out some positivity. They want someone to share the share their electrons with. So they're going to we're, look for protons and protons can be found in the nucleus, hence the word nucleophiles. So they love proton, they love the nucleus because that's where the protons are. They're going to seek out something that wants wants to share um, wants to share some positivity. So electrophiles, basically, they want more electrons. And so these are what the nucleophile is going to attack. By attacking the electrophile, well, now you can do things like form new bonds, um, form double bonds, or deprotonate, all this good stuff. It starts with the nucleophile attacking the electrophile, and this is what you're going to represent in your arrow pushing diagrams. In terms of the nucleophiles that we'll see in biochemistry, um, these are often going to be things like hydroxyl groups. Um, 
Um, deprotonated is especially strong. We'll see amine, amine groups. We'll see like um, the histidines and minazole ring. We'll see double and triple. We'll see double and triple bonds. In terms of our electrophiles, well, here we'll be doing dealing with things like um, the C and carbonyls. This is going to be a really big one. So the oxygen is going to be pulling away from that carbon, uh, making the carbon partly positive. Another common one is going to be the P and phosphates. And so similarly to how the C was positively partly positive because the oxygen is pulling away electrons from it, the um, the phosphor the phosphates in these phosphate groups are going to be partly positive because the oxygens are pulling electrons away from it. And we'll also see things like an ammonium cation serve as our electrophiles. In terms of the reactions that we're actually going to see, so remember you start from your nucleophile, you go to the electrophile, and then what happens is going to depend on the reaction mechanism. So you might kick off the leaving group, um, get a new, like a substitution reaction. You might um, get an elimination reaction. You might just like steal a proton. Um, so all of these can happen. And this is just happening from going from a nucleophile to an electrophile. So here's an example of like what a transition state in an intermediate would actually look like. So this is going to be one of the kind of like most common mechanisms that we're going to see is going to be a nucleophile attacking a carbonyl carbon. So in this case, you have water attacking an ester, um, which we'll talk about this itself when it be very favorable. And so we can activate and have a stronger nucleophile to make things more um more favorable. But what's going to happen, thinking back to your OCHEM, is that nucleophile is going to attack the carbonyl carbon. That's going to push the electrons from this double bond onto the oxygen as a lone pair um, and give you this intermediate here. But in order to get to that intermediate, well, you first had to make this bond and then you had to break this double bond. And in order to do that, you had to go through a transition state at which the bond was partly formed and the, this bond was partly broken. And so we can represent this these like partial bonds as these dotted lines, which gets kind of confusing um, because we often also draw like hydrogen bonds and things with dotted lines. But in this case, we know it's a transition state in part because it is surrounded by brackets and it's showing us this double dagger symbol. Note that in our intermediate in this reaction, in this weird tetrahedral intermediate, we basically have it where there's a positive charge on the oxygen and the negative charge on this oxygen. So in order in order to get there, well, we had to have a transition state where we had a partial charge on this and a partial charge on this. So a transition state will have partial charges. Um, it will have partial bonds formed and broken, um, and it will be temporary fleeting. But then you will have an intermediate that's going to be the real deal that you could at least theoretically isolate. And then this intermediate can get broken down to form your products. But as I mentioned, so just like pure water alone isn't going to be a very good nucleophile. And so often what we're going to do is we're going to activate water or we're going to use an alternative if we want to have an acid-base reaction. So there are two kind of main types of acid-base catalysis. These are going to be general acid-base catalysis which uses acids and bases other than water, or specific acid-base catalysis, which uses water as the acid or base. And so we'll look at some examples in a minute, um, but so specific specifically uses water, general can use any sort of acid or a base. And so we'll see how we can have like amino acid side chains playing this role. Um, and so here it might be kind of small on your screen, but you can go and look at the link um, basically with specific acid catalysis. Here, what you're going to be doing is you start by taking a proton from water. Well, now what is this doing? This is going to make this a stronger electrophile, make it easier for the water to attack it, uh, make it more favorable. You reach this transition state um, and then you can get broken down. So remember, transition state, temporary, intermediate. It's, also, it's still temporary, but it's not as fleeting. In the case of general acid catalysis, well, here you're taking that proton from something else. So in here, we basically am having taking from acetic acid, but you could have it be taking from, say, a serine in an active site. And so that would be general acid catalysis, where basically you're starting by protonating from something that is not water, um, and then you get this, you're able to then activate this, make it easier 
to um, reach the transition state. So you can have a weaker nucleophile attack it, um, and then you get to the intermediate. With base catalysis, well, here your strategy is to use a stronger nucleophile. Um, so use a hydroxyl ion as your nucleophile to attack the carbonyl carbon. Um, and here that hydroxyl ion, it could be coming directly from water, in which case it's like specific base catalysis, or it could be that the water had to be activated. And so if the water basically has to be activated, um, you can have, we say like a general base catalysis. So you have something act as a base, take a proton from water in order to get that hydroxyl that can then go and attack. So that's an, um, an example of a general base catalysis. In terms of general acid and general base, so in the in those examples, it was coming from like acetic acid as well as like the cimetazole, but you could also be coming, it can be coming from an imidazole that's actually part of a histidine on a protein sticking into the active site. It could be coming from a lysine or an arginine amine. It could be coming from a deprotonated um, at cysteine or aspartate, glutamate, serine, tyrosine, all those groups with an OH. Um, that O with it loses that H, um, it can then form as a, act as a general base and take a proton. They can also, when they're pronated, then act as general acids. And so often what we'll see is we'll see them act as both an acid and a base because remember that the enzyme kind of has to get reset in order for, for the reaction to happen again, for it to be catalyzed again. Those are cases in which the enzyme is kind of going to be acting through water to help make things happen, or at least just like donate, giving or donating protons or taking protons um, to, to the substrate, but without actually binding to the substrate, like directly through covalent bonds. But some enzymes actually do participate covalently in the reaction mechanism. So covalent catalysis involves intermediates in which part of the substrate is covalently attached to the enzyme. And so again, we have those kind of like same culprits that can do this. So remember that those nucleophilic amino acids, they if they take a proton, um, then we call them a base. We say they're acting as a base. But if they go and attack something, we say they're acting as a nucleophile. And if they attack something, um, and they stay stuck through like a substitution reaction type of deal. Um, well, in that or in addition, in that case, what you're going to have is you're going to have a bond formed, like a covalent bond formed to your substrate. And so when we're talking about what could be participating in covalent catalysis, you want to look in the active site for things like serine, threonine, tyrosine, cysteine, lysine, or histidine. Um, but then also remember that these can also be acting as acid-base um, things. And so we'll, you typically, in order to know how a reaction actually happens, like you would want to go and look at a reaction mechanism diagram, um, which is what we'll talk about more about. And I'm not going to like expect you to know how, like which amino acids are participating directly um, without giving you any more information. So one of the examples of a covalent catalysis that we'll talk about is serine proteases. Um, so basically, in this case, a protease, that's something that cuts um, that cuts proteins or cuts peptides. Um, and so we've talked in class about how we can use like site-specific proteases to cut off affinity tags when we're doing like protein purification. Um, but there's also all sorts of different proteases, including in our body, um, that are going to do important things like help us digest food, help us... Um, break down tissue to get the um to get like immune stuff to it um and all sorts of various things and so we'll talk more about that when we talk about enzyme inhibitors but a lot of these work with this like catalytic tria triad that we'll look at in a minute where basically what's going to happen is that you have this covalent catalysis where the peptide like as it's getting cut the peptide it actually gets stuck onto the enzyme and then gets released. And so you have this covalent intermediate. When you have one of those intermediates, well, now what's going to happen is that you have a new point on your co reaction coordinate diagram. So you don't need to worry about all of these details. This is just to show you that these reaction coordinate diagrams, you can have these um, all of these different, different peaks. The, the enzyme is making it take like a sort of complicated route. Um, so you don't have that enzyme just, you don't just go from having that protein, that peptide whole to having it broken. Um, it's not just going to like poof break. Instead, you go through multiple steps. You go through these multiple states with it's actually going to be 
binding directly to the, and like covalently binding to the enzyme and having these different transition states and intermediates. So remember that the intermediates, these are the more stable points. These are going to be our troughs, um, the, the bases of the curves. Those will be our intermediates. And then these, these transition states, these are going to be our peaks. And so you can see that the intermediates are going to correspond to points at which you actually have things going to be like um, fully bond. But then in these transition states, you have these partial bond formations. So you're always going to have a transition state on either side of your intermediate. Because remember, to get from one, one thing, one form to another, to get from that point when you're stuck on the scissor state to that point when you've released things, you're going to have to actually change. You're going to have to release things. You're going to have to um, break something. You're going to have to do something. And so you're going to have a transition state to get to the next point. This could be to get back to the substrate. This could be to go forward to the product. But there's always going to be uh, this hump. So you're going to have a transition state on either side of your intermediate. And if you have multiple intermediates, each of these is going to have a transition state. And things can get really, really complicated where you have a lot of transition states and a lot of intermediates. But the only one that's going to matter the most is going to be the one with the highest activation barrier. Um, and so sometimes they can sometimes they can have ones that are pretty similar in their activation barriers, but often you're going to have one that's like that's really the rate limiting step. And it won't always be the first one, um, as we've seen saw in a couple other examples. But one of them is typically going to be um, have the biggest delta G, dug, delta G double dagger. So first, so why don't you um, now answer, try to answer these following questions? How many intermediates and transition states does each have? Rank them from least to most thermodynamically favorable, and tell me which happens easiest and thus fastest. Okay, let's start with how many intermediates and transition states. They made it kind of easy in these figures because it's like int and TS3 or TS, um, so intermediate and transition state, but you would be able to know based on looking for the troughs. Um, and so each of these is an intermediate and then each of these is a, trans a transition state. These, um, and so this one would have two intermediates, three transition states. This would have one intermediate, two transition states. And this would have three intermediates and four transition states. Um, and remember, the intermediates are the, going to be the kind of like isolatable things. Um, and these would be the transition states. That's our tipping point. That's the thing that we really care about. But we can't like actually capture it. OK, which is the least to most thermodynamically favorable? So remember, what do we need to think about when it comes to thermodynamic favorability? Yeah, we need to think about our overall delta G, the difference between our substrates and our products. And so we need to be looking at the start and at the end. We can ignore everything else that happens in between. So it's kind of hard to tell with these diagrams, but let's say we draw a line over to here, over to here, and over to here. And now we want to see like what would our delta G be? Well, here they're pretty similar, so that wouldn't be that favorable. Um, so this would be R1. How about this one? This one is this one's more favorable um, than the first one, but is it more favorable than this one? No. So this would be R2, and this would be R3. So the first would be our least thermodynamically favorable, but still favorable slightly because it's got a negative delta G. The second is going to be more favorable, and then the third is going to be the most favorable. So remember, that's telling us about equal. If you let them reach equilibrium, we'd expect that we'd have more of um, more of our products, the most products in the case of number three. But which is going to happen easiest and thus fastest? Now, what do we need to consider? Now we need to consider our delta G double dagger. And so, if we consider that, well, we've got a big one here. We're up to about a hundred kilojoules per mole. Um, for this one, we're a little under 75. This one looks like we're about a little over 75 as well. And so basically what's going to happen easiest is it's going to be two and three. And the hardest is going to be one.
uh, because it's got the highest activation barrier. So be forewarned that coordinate diagrams can get really, really complicated and don't worry about those. All I need you to do is be able to look at a coordinate uh, diagram, recognize what is like where the intermediates are, where the transition states are, use them to identify if overall the reaction has a is thermodynamically favorable, and identify what the rate limiting step would be. So if we look at what would be the rate limiting step here, well, it looks like although this although TS3 is going to have the highest free energy, it actually looks like it's going to have a smaller activation barrier than getting from this in three to this TS4, to this transition state. But I'm not going to be showing you anything as complicated as this, so don't worry about it. Okay, but do worry about how enzymes are actually going to be doing that stabilization, how they're going to be doing that energy reduction, how they're going to be making those reactions more favorable. Okay, so we talked about how they can kind of like stabilize the awkward transition states. What else can they do? Well, remember that an enzyme catalyzes things in both directions. So it's going to go, it can't change the equilibrium that's formed. It can just make it form faster. And so when you are like a stick, a crayon breaker, also by definition has to be a crayon maker, like former. And so it might be really, really, really hard for them to form, but um, I mean, theoretically it's possible. Maybe if you stick them in the sun or something in your hands, you have enough energy, put enough energy in with your hand warmth or something. Bottom line is that we can think about, uh, think about like remaking the crayon. In order to remake the crayon, well, if your pieces were still in your hand, it'd be a lot easier than if your pieces were like, what, you threw away one and then the the truck came and they took it to the dump and you have a piece all the way over there and then you have a piece in here and the pieces have to find each other and come together in the right orientation to react and yeah basically we need some help getting our getting our substrates together um or getting our molecules together in order to in order to react and so in order to do this the enzymes kind of take the cost they take the entropy cut um take the entropy ding in order to kind of like bring the things together and hold them in the right orientation. Um, and so this can be, this can involve those interactions with all those like weak interactions that are going to be kind of like holding it specifically in the right way. It can involve, like this is what this is gonna do is it's gonna like increase the local concentration of things. Often you might have enzymes kind of be hanging out in the same place, maybe even scaffolded together um, with a like another protein kind of like holding together related enzymes. All these various strategies to kind of bring these bring these molecules together in order to react. They're also kind of going to make it easier for those molecules to see one another, even when they're like even if they're close, they wouldn't be able to see it, one another if they were surrounded by water. And so molecules can have like a salvation shell. Um, that's going to be those interactions with the water that are important for making those to make those substrates like soluble, but they can also hide important regions. And so the enzymes can kind of like remove that water coat, but still keep the stuff soluble by replacing the bonds to water with bonds to the enzyme. So we talked a little about how we can get these like weird charge intermediates build up during a reaction process. Um, and these, these can be really awkward and unstable. And we saw how like enzymes can kind of give and take protons, so act as an acid or a base um, and or help water do that um, in our acid-base catalysis. And they can also do like electron loaning um, and help stabilize charge that way through the use of metals. Um, and so we'll see like metal, metal catalysis as well. And it's not like enzymes will just use one of these strategies. They'll often couple a few of these different things together. So here's an example of metal catalysis. So basically the reason why, if you've ever done PCR and you might've tagged like add magnesium to your little PCR mix, um, basically DNA polymerase, the enzyme that joins together the oxynucleotides to make DNA chains it's going to require magnesium to help it out. And basically what this magnesium is going to do is it's gonna be kind of in the, anchored into the protein by active, by residues in the active site, they're gonna kind of be coordinating with that metal. And what this is going to do is it's gonna hold that metal in place. 
And now you have this positively charged metal. What it's going to kind of do is it's going to help lower the um, lower the pKa of the of the end of the chain of the DNA. So basically, it's going to make it easier to deprotonate. Um, it's going to make it easier to deprotonate this OH, which is going to allow it to attack that phosphate group. So oxygen is going to be a much better nucleophile once you've deprotonated it. And so this um, this magnesium is going to help make it easier to deprotonate it once it um, gives up that proton. Well, now it's going to be a strong nucleophile that's then going to be able to attack our electrophile of that phosphate, which is going to then um, kick that off. And the other magnesium is going to help hold, the, hold this letter in place um, and stabilize those intermediates as well. So here's an example of like multiple strategies put to use together. This is going to be a phosphorylation reaction that are happening, um, that are catalyzed by enzymes called kinases. So what kinases are going to do is they're going to take um, the phosphate, the phosphoryl group from ATP and put it onto some sort of substrate. And so when we're talking about a protein phosphatase, it's going to be transferring this phosphate group onto a protein at a serine, threonine, tyrosine, one of the amino acids that one of those ones that can act as a nucleophile because it's going to need to be able to attack that phosphate group and push things off. But remember that this would not be a very good nucleophile. Um, instead, we want to activate it. And in order to activate it, we can remove this proton to make a hydroxyl group that would be a good nucleophile, that would be very attacky. Um, it would be a good base. And so what we're going to do is in the enzyme active site, there's going to be another amino acid that's basically going to serve as a general base. It's going to abstract that proton. It's going to steal that proton, act as a base, steal that proton, which is going to make this negatively charged. It's going to make this nucleophilic. It's going to make this want to attack um, the phosphate group. And so then this is going to attack that phosphate group and push off the other phosphates. Um, and so the magnesiums are going to help pull electrons away from those phosphorus, phosphates, um, making from the phosphorus, making it partly positive and thus very attractive. Um, and it's going to help stabilize all those intermediates and things like this. Um, and so you're able to make a new substrate um, bond, so make a new um, substrate phosphate bond, and then break this phosphate phosphate bond. Um, and so you can think about in your intermediate in your transition state, you would have a state where this bond was forming and this form this bond was breaking. And that would be the point at which the kinase is going to most stabilize. So I know that was a lot of information. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of examples in class. Again, you don't need to worry about the specific mechanisms and being able to draw out the specific mechanisms of every enzyme. Um, but rather, I want you to be able to kind of follow the flow in these diagrams and be able to kind of identify the changes that are going on and some of the strategies that enzymes are using to help make those changes possible. So remember that enzymes are biological catalysts. They speed up reactions without being used up in the process. And the way that they speed up these reactions is basically by lowering the activation barrier. They can do these in a variety of ways, including making lots of weak interactions um, with the substrate that are going to help provide the binding energy to offset the cost. And they're going to provide specificity. Sometimes the enzymes get um, actually get directly involved in the reaction by like forming covalent intermediates. Um, but often it's just going to be non-covalent interactions. And even if it has covalent interactions, it's also going to, the bulk of the power is really coming from that non-covalent stuff. Sometimes enzymes go work with helpers. So they have like, um, mag they have metal ions or they have like, um, they have other organic groups. Remember that substrate is just the name for the thing that the enzyme binds and acts on. The substrate binds to the active site and gets changed into products. The enzyme catalyzes things in both directions, forward and backwards. It can't um, change the equilibrium. It can only make the, it, make the reaction get there faster. Sometimes it does these through complicated pathways, but when you're looking at a reaction coordinate diagram, note that the intermediates are going to be your the valleys in between the peaks, and then the peaks themselves are gonna be the transition state. Um, remember transition states, we represent with that double dagger. 
that's kind of the tipping point. And it's um, so unstable that we can't even see it. We can't even isolate it. And it's that point that the enzyme is going to um, hug the most, care the most about. Um, and so that's where you're going to have the most of those favorable interactions. Um, and so enzymes are often going to, the active site's kind of going to look like the the transition state, that really uncomfy state. Um, but in order to get there, you have to have the sort of induced fit where the enzyme's kind of changing shape gently around the substrate, um, providing that binding energy, getting it to that transition state and helping it reach that, um, helping make that easier to get to. If you look at a reaction coordinate diagram, um, you, you'll have basically one of the transitions, a transition state on either side of an intermediate. And the one with the biggest delta G double dagger, the biggest change in free energy, um, the biggest activation barrier is going to be your rate limiting step. We'll talk a lot, lot more about enzyme rates and enzyme kinetics, but first let's start about getting these basics of enzymes down.